Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks for having us today. This has been great so far. Happy to be here. I'm in a really tough spot here. Now there's a lot of pressure I gotta fly through because now I'm standing in the way of lunch. <laughs> so hopefully, bear with me. Um, hopefully you'll take something away from this. Um, I look around the room and I know for a fact that a lot of you could probably come up here and put on a pretty good show on this topic, uh, just like I can because you've been around so long um, and have lots of good experience. Today, the, the title on the agenda is just a little bit misleading. I'd like to broaden it up just a little bit, um, just to talk more generally about wildlife conflicts. Um, the reality is this is where we live. We live in a tremendous wildlife habitat, um, lots of diversity with our wildlife. And eventually, if you live here long enough, you and I will be talking, or one of my coworkers and you will be talking, or I'll be talking to you about conflict issues and how to resolve some of them. Uh, and that's because of the beauty of the place we live. So again, I'm Brandon Diamond. I'm a district wildlife manager, and my district now is sort of the northwest quarter of the Gunnison Basin. Um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife is the primary wildlife management agency in Colorado. As most of you know, we are a branch of the state government. Um, and just a fun piece of trivia that I always like to, to put out there because Oftentimes when we're dealing with different people, um, some folks will throw out there that my tax dollars pay your wages and by golly you ought to do this or this or this. And just a fun piece of trivia again is that the majority of Parks and Wildlife's budget is actually derived from the sales of hunting and fishing licenses and now that we've integrated parks, um, fees and permits and passes. It's just something to be aware of and interesting, something hunters and fishermen should be proud of. All right, so you might be asking, what in the world is a district wildlife manager? We're a little bit different than some of our other western states in that, in some states, my position uh, would be all law enforcement. So in Colorado, we are the game wardens. We are the folks that are out there enforcing the law, but that's only a portion of our job. Um, we actually deal with, with a lot more. Our job is very diverse in that we do a lot of wildlife management work. And then we also do a lot of work that includes stuff like this as far as educational efforts go. We deal with landowners a lot on different issues. Um, every day is a little bit different. So district wildlife manager job is really diverse. So the agenda real quick. Um, we want to define what a conflict is. I think everybody has a little bit different interpretation of that word, but we'll kind of boil it down in terms of wildlife. Talk about some of the causes of conflicts with wildlife and people. And most importantly, some of the resolutions, uh, some of the ways to avoid them entirely. That would be my goal for the day. Uh, I also want to just talk briefly about some of Parks and Wildlife's bigger picture programs that help address some of these issues, um, damages and conflicts, and then we'll wrap it up. So a working definition for conflict might be an interaction between people and wild animals, or an interaction between wild animals and people that results in a negative impact to either people and their property or wildlife, animal, wildlife and their habitats. So it's kind of a two-way road there. We give as, as well as we get in many cases. More practical definition though, I think when you boil it down, conflicts and nuisance wildlife issues often are simply a product of um, a human inconvenience. So it's an inconvenience to us um, in terms of our time, in terms of our property, and certainly it can be an inconvenience in terms of the economics and some of those issues that wildlife cause. So sort of small scale examples, we can look at things like ground squirrels versus a flower bed. It's a pain to deal with. Skunk versus dog, one that a lot of you are familiar with, that's a good one. Certainly a human inconvenience. Uh, and then they can get a little bit more serious. So marmot versus a car. Every year we deal with marmots in cars. They love getting into engine compartments. They can chew up electronics. It's a bad situation. Woodpeckers versus a house is another common one we get around here. Once a woodpecker starts tapping on your house and, and burning up your boards, that's certainly a problem. Or an, again, in terms of economics, fox versus chickens. So we see all of those things and have the potential for those in our area. Parks and Wildlife does have a few different uh, definitions when it comes to conflicts. An example is depredating. Um, so in certain instances, we classify our particular animal as a depredating animal. Uh, last summer, north of Gunnison, we had uh, a black bear that was killing sheep. That's a depredating animal. It's killing livestock. 
A dangerous animal um, is a little bit different, and those are, those are animals we take very seriously. Um, and that could be by their behavior. We could have a black bear or a mountain lion or a coyote that's act actually acting aggressively towards people. Uh, or it could simply be just the product of, of where they're at. Uh, it's been a long time now, we don't get these very often, but several years ago we had a mountain lion that was hiding underneath a camper trailer over by Legion Park. And it caused a lot of hysteria in the community. We ended up tranquilizing and moving that animal. It really wasn't doing anything. All it wanted to do was get out of town, uh, but it couldn't, and so the stage was set there for these conflicts. Nuisance animals, and again, we can all interpret what nuisance means, but consistently causing property damage, human no fault. You know, you're not trying to encourage ground squirrels by planting a, a flower garden or a vegetable garden. It, it just can happen. But I think a, a lot of a lot of what we see are just animals being animals, right? We live right amongst them, they're our neighbors, and they're simply living their day-to-day -day lives and taking advantage of human resources that become available to them. They mean you no harm, they're just doing what they do and making a living. Now sometimes, um, you know, again, talking about the location of these animals, if you were to pull into your yard uh, and see a mountain lion dart through the yard there, that would probably be something very novel to you and it would, it would generate for many people sort of an emotional response based on fear, um, based on misunderstanding of the animal, based on the fact that you never see an animal or very rarely do you see an animal like that in town. Um, most of the time when we get these calls and we do like hearing about them, the animals are not intending any harm. Um, they just end up in the wrong place at the wrong time from our perspective. So again, that is a source of a potential conflict within our community. And again, we live in one of the last best places of Colorado, um, and so there's the potential for conflict with a whole suite of different species, and that's just a few of them. Um, you know, you look at that, that picture of W Mountain in our community, or portion of our community, and obviously we have a tremendous diversity of both wildlife habitats how people's residences and things fit in amongst those habitats. And of course, we have the Gunnison River, Tamichi Creek, all of those main waterways have always been and will continue to be corridors for wildlife that's moving through the valley. So we can certainly expect to see most of these critters on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. All right, so causes of conflicts. Um, I can take a pretty good guess what the cause of that conflict is, right? Let's talk about a few of them. And one of the things that we talk about, no matter really, when we're talking about any wildlife issue, we tend to focus on habitat. Habitat is everything for the critters in our valley. If we want to continue to be uh, blessed with the diversity and abundance of wildlife that we have locally, we need to conserve their habitat. Um, as Colorado's population continues to grow, which we all know there's no end in sight, we're pushing five and a half, six million people, there are people wanting to be everywhere all the time doing everything. And that leads to what we call habitat fragmentation. And fragmentation is a big deal. And essentially, just to boil it down, what we're talking about is we're, we're talking about taking a large block of functional habitat, no matter what the species is, and we're breaking it into smaller chunks, islands of habitat. This could be the result of a road, could be the result of a trail, could be the result of a subdivision. Lots of different ways we fragment habitat, but once we do that, what it means long term is that this is probably not as valuable to the species that inhabited it when it was in a larger contiguous block. And then what we see, some species take different paths as habitat is fragmented. You can have avoidance or attraction depending on the species you're talking about. So when I say avoidance, what we're talking about would be displacement into less desirable habitat. Some animals are much less adaptable to habitat fragmentation than others. And a good example here locally is elk. We talk about elk, elk, elk all the time in my line of work. We have places where elk are now avoiding public lands and they're camping on private lands because they find refuge there. And it creates huge management challenges for us. And part of the reason why is the fragmentation of their traditional habitats. On the flip side of the coin, you talk about a species like a red fox. Red fox exploit um, the human environment very well. They're, they're a critter that can be subsidized as far as food goes 
by our development. So they tend to thrive in environments like ours. So it depends on the species. Um, but for some animals, I mean, they have no choice but to live amongst us. So once we're on top of each other, certainly the potential for future conflicts um, and situations are there to arise. So, another reason when we're talking about the causes of some of these conflicts, and it's one that I think people don't think about um, as readily, and that is architectural designs. And so if you are on the verge of building a new residence or modifying your property in some way, think about how those changes or that development is going to sort of set the stage for conflict. And there's some great examples here. Um, overhanging window eaves, you know, those are perfect places for a species like barn swallow to build their nests. All right, we deal with, we hear about this kind of stuff all the time. Those nooks and crannies, wildlife love them, bats love them, uh, swallows love them, lots of species do. Window wells, if you have a window well in your house uh, and you haven't had some kind of wildlife critter down in it that can't get out, it's just a matter of time. This is an interesting picture of an owl, um, but we've had everything up to and including mountain lions, moose, bears, deer, you name it. Sometimes they get in the window well, if they come through the window into the house, that's an even bigger problem. But window wells are a constant source of, of conflict. Um, fences, obviously. Um, we, my materials are over here, feel free to pick, pick anything you want up, but we have a, a whole brochure there on fencing with wildlife in mind. Fences cause all sorts of grief for us and for the wildlife species that are try, trying to move across the landscape. Um, I threw this picture on here, this isn't locally, but there's a lot of residences in Gunnison that have similar fences like that, and we fish all sorts of deer out of them every year. Sometimes they're fatal. So think about how your fences are gonna impact wildlife. Um, and then this one I put in here because it's really interesting and something that most folks don't think about. Little things like lever handles on doors. I had, several years ago, I had a bear up near Crested Butte on the periphery of town that was just doing his thing, cruising around some of those neighborhoods in those real remote areas. He came to a house and he was probably just sort of standing up to look in the door and he went and that lever handle opened, the front door opened. And the bear, went, of course, went in the house um, and caused all sorts of havoc. But lever handles are a big one that a lot of folks don't think about. So think about how your architectural design can set the stage for wildlife conflict. Another good one that shouldn't be any surprise to anybody, non-native vegetation, including gardens. We, again, we're subsidizing uh, these animals' forage um, on a daily basis. And some of these species are incredible. Things like vegetable gardens, of course, are incredibly palatable to these animals and are, and are a source of attraction for them. So in Gunnison, if you come out and see this on any given day, it's no surprise. If you've got a black bear in your vegetable garden, you're going to be bummed out. Um, but just expect those kinds of things if those are the, the things that you're trying to work into your day-to-day -day life. Another one we talked to, and it's certainly not limited to backyard chickens by any means, but chickens and hobby livestock have generated all sorts of conflict, whether it's here or anywhere in the state of Colorado. You know, we can talk about this particular slide all day long. There's lots and lots of things here that we could have done differently to avoid conflicts that probably were to follow. Um, so think about these things. Lots of folks want hobby chickens, and I get that, but you've got to be prepared uh, to keep, keep the wild critters at bay. So with a lot of things, um, like a lot of aspects of our lives. There are lots of regulations that go along um, with wildlife in Colorado. Some are statutory, some are set by our Colorado Parks and Wildlife Regulation or Commission. Uh, but please don't hesitate to ask. And I don't, uh, I don't have all the answers in the top of my head, but if you come up with some novel situation that we have to sort through, I can figure out how to get you the right answer. So please ask. Um, and asking ahead of time is certainly better than asking after the fact. For example, um, Parks and Wildlife Commission Regulation 021 makes it unlawful to place, deposit, distribute, scatter, grain, hay, minerals, salt, or other foods to intentionally constitute a lure, attraction, enticement for big game, other wildlife, coyotes, or foxes. How many of you knew that? It is illegal to put a salt block in your yard to bring deer into the yard. And if we, if we detect those, we're, we have an obligation to talk to you about those issues. And the bottom line is most conflicts are absolutely the result of us failing to prevent them. And there's tons of examples. 
Bear proofing your house really takes no time at all. You know, sometimes there's some challenges and a little bit of inconvenience again, but it's worth, worth the effort. Um, gardens, inadequate fencing. Um, we have a little garden plot in town. It's fenced for deer. It shocks me every day that I go there that the raccoons don't find it, but if they do, I guess we'll figure out how to fix that. Bird feeders cause so much grief on so many levels for so many people, particularly in terms of bears and deer. Um, it's a very simple thing to try to manage your bird feeders. And in my opinion, um, having bird feeders out is not so important that a bear should die. So it's, it's one of those things that we can talk about a bunch um, and all learn from each other on. Outside pet food is another big one. If you have ad lib dog or cat food on the front porch, eventually it's gonna be a problem. And water is the same way, um, particularly in the hotter months uh, where, where water's a little short and critters are looking for a drink. And then hay is another big one. If you're a person with a couple of horses um, and you're adjacent to deer or elk habitat, it's likely, particularly in bad winters, that eventually those deer and elk are gonna find that haystack. We don't want you to suffer economic losses. We don't want there to be any health issues with the deer and elk. Um, and we try to cut those off at the pass. So with the conflict resolution, all of these efforts help. And I know you can all help us in terms of educating your neighbors, your family, um, because I know a lot of times when there is a wildlife conflict, folks don't call us immediately. They probably call you. Um, so help them out. Education is definitely the preferred solution. And I think this is really important because education leads to respect for wildlife. Respect, in turn, leads to tolerance. If you moved here from somewhere else, you probably weren't completely prepared to wake up one day and find a mountain lion walking through your backyard. You know, so having that tolerance goes back to education, and tolerance leads to consideration for wildlife. We can coexist. I do believe that, and it's really not that hard. Um, so t the consideration for wildlife integrates wildlife and their conservation into all of our day-to-day -day activities, including big picture, big ticket items like land use planning and community planning. So this is what I would call the conservation mantra. And we, we deal with this all the time in our line of work, whether we're commenting on a county road permit um, or a development that's slated to go in. And the mantra is avoid, minimize, and mitigate in that order. If we can avoid issues right from the get-go, that is certainly better than having to try to mitigate after the fact. So the conservation mantra. All right, and I give Chris Parmeter, my neighboring district wildlife manager, um, credit for this joke. Do you know what the difference is between a developer and an environmentalist? A developer wants to build a house in the woods. An environmentalist already has one there, right? <laughs> That's kind of that not in my backyard philosophy. So let's run through a hypothetical scenario here that sort of illustrates the avoid, minimize, mitigate um, mantra. So, a developer wants to build a house out in the woods, okay? It can be in right here in our backyards. Say that the woods, the, the area he wants to build in is predominantly woods, so the majority of the habitat out there is woodlands for wildlife. However, this particular location has a big wet meadow associated with it. Within the broader landscape of the woodlands, you have this wet meadow that is really, really important to wildlife. 90% of the species in that area are coming to that wet meadow at some point during the day or the week or the month of the year to live out their annual cycles. So it's a really special, unique piece of habitat. So we would talk to the developer. He has choices or she has choices. Avoidance. So instead of building the house right adjacent to the wet meadow, where it's going to create tremendous fragmentation and disturbance for wildlife species that depend on it. They could build the house on the other side of the ridge from the wet meadow. We've avoided most of the problem associated with that development and that human activity. Avoidance, wildlife wins, hopefully the developer still wins. Minimize. You can still build close to the wet meadow because they want to look out and see it. They want to see the cool wildlife that come in there on a day-to-day -day basis. But you can build back a little bit and use architectural design and landscaping features. Maybe you can plant trees in front of the bulk of the house, kind of conceal the house back a little bit that would actually minimize the disturbance within that wet metal complex. Mitigation. The developer decides, you know, that, that meadow's important. We're gonna build it up, fill it in. We're gonna build our house right smack dab in the middle of it. But after we do that, we're going to find a similar area 
and try to recreate a wetland in another area for wildlife. So we've lost some here, we've gained some here. That's mitigation. That's a lot more expensive and a lot harder to do. But those are kind of the steps that we go through, um, again, whether it's a, a house going in or a larger scale development. Avoid, minimize, mitigate. All right, so quickly we'll try to burn through some of this. Ways to help yourself. So again, going back to laws and regulations. If you have an animal that's causing you grief, you know, am I saying that you can go out and shoot and kill any animal that's causing you inconvenience at any time? No. But there are provisions in state statute and in our regulations that allow you to take wildlife that are causing damage and do so without a license. So most of what we do to take wildlife, you have to have a license. In this case, you don't. 336-1079 of Colorado Revised Statutes allows you to take certain critters. If they're causing damage to crops, real or personal property, um, or livestock, and those species are spelled out. There's really no definition of damage in Title 33, but that's a common sense thing. It certainly should be something tangible. It's not just an animal walking through your yard. And as far as the take goes, there's different ways to achieve that. There's lethal and non-lethal means. So lethal, some of the examples you can think about are poison. Um, poisons are highly regulated in Colorado. Uh, you are allowed to use them for certain species, not others. But at the end of the day, a lot of them are non-discriminatory. Uh, we like to get it as tightly focused on the animal causing damage as possible. Shooting is another one, um, you know, and, and, and a somewhat effective, cost-effective way of doing that. But there are certainly areas where the discharge of firearms is not legal or allowed, such as inside the city limits of Gunnison. And so there's issues there. You've got to know what you can legally do and not do. Um, Non-lethal we like a little bit better as a wildlife advocacy agency. Um, so some of those methods non-lethally would be trapping and relocating. Um, can you just trap any species that's in your backyard and move it anywhere you want? No. Um, those guidelines are provided and those sideboards are provided in regulation and statute. But we do have options for relocating certain species. Some species like skunks, we do not allow relocation. And most of that probably ties back to disease concerns and rabies and things like that. Uh, so some animals either need to be released on site or killed on site once they're trapped. The other issue we run into, and this is getting harder and harder in Colorado, where do you relocate them? We simply don't want to just be moving the problem around or dumping the problem onto our neighbors. So we have to be conscious of that. 30-day um, permits. In 1996, I believe, Amendment 14 was passed that prohibited certain methods of taking wildlife, like uh, leg hold traps, body gripping traps, snares. Um, that was kind of a big deal at the time. We do, there was an agricultural exemption worked into that amendment um, that allows us to give you a 30-day permit to use some of those tools for a target damage issue. And in the valley, most of the 30-day permits that I've been a part of are associated with beavers and irrigation systems. Those options are out there. USDA Wildlife Services, we still work with a lot. We have a contract with them. Most of what they help us with um, are bear and lion conflicts um, and dealing with professional government houndsmen that address specific animals once damage has occurred, um, such as loss to livestock. We also, uh, and a lot of you know, we, we try to use these other non-lethal means like rubber buckshot, um, pyrotechnics that make noise or make flashing sounds. Um, we help landowners out with those, uh, particularly with species like bears um, and elk. Um, and then there's also other deterrents like actually removing, if you have beaver dams that are causing you grief on your private property, we know a lot of those beaver dams um, get modified throughout the year. 336-128, this statute actually um, protects dens and nests and wildlife from harassment, but has those exemptions in it. Uh, people can't, their dogs cannot just go chase and kill deer um, on any given day, that's illegal. However, if we're having issues with particular other species, we can address it with some of these exemptions. 33.1063 addresses bears and lions specifically. Um, if a bear is trying to break in your back door, it's pushing on the door and you know it's about to get really ugly really quickly, you are legally entitled to kill that animal um, for the protection of human life, livestock, real property, or motor vehicles. Um, does that mean that if a bear is walking through your backyard and passing through, you can shoot it? Of course not. Um, but there, 
certainly we have to consider public safety, and there are legitimate instances where there's a public safety issue with regards to bears and lions. So again, just to kind of beat the dead horse here, if the attraction remains, wildlife will continue to exploit those resources. And some of these slides, some of these photos I put in really specifically so you can look at the stuff we look at. When someone calls and says they're having bear problems in a situation like this, or the deer are getting out of hand, or the 50 deer they have in their backyard every day suddenly attract a mountain lion, the source of the problem is very obvious. And we are going to tell you to remove those attractants so that we can nip the problem in the bud. So, best case scenario to fix a lot of these problems is remove the attractant. And really, it, you know, get, get a friend or a family member, your wife, your husband, go outside and just do a quick inventory of your property. It doesn't take long at all. It's like, oh, there it is. I don't know why we didn't think of that. Could be horse grain. Certainly in this case, it's a big old bowl of uh, cat food. Um, and one of the things that we try to point out to people is their actions are impacting their neighbors as well. So they may love to see the 30, 40 deer in their yard every day, but their neighbors losing all the aspen trees they just planted, and we're caught in the crossfire. So remove the attractant. Folks, some folks are talking about, uh, they're calling it urban armoring, okay, in terms of wildlife. There's lots of things you can do, again, to prevent and avoid these problems from the very get-go. There are lots of plants out there, and I'm sure we have some expertise in the room, that could help you plant beautiful uh, landscaping ornamental type plants that are less palatable to deer um, or bears or whatever the case may be. Those resources are out there. So plant, when, you, when you go and you buy your $40 lupine plant or columbines from Ace Hardware and you plant them and they're gone in three days and you know the deer ate them, you should expect that. I've come to expect that. Um, Stuff like this, uh, if you don't want rabbits in your flower or your vegetable garden or other small mammals and you're in the process of kind of thinning out your property and you're providing these huge brush piles and cover piles for those small mammals, you can expect to have problems. Get rid of those brush piles because lots of animals use them for cover and habitat. And of course, guard dogs. Um, I was just talking to Bill about using uh, donkeys. Um, to protect their sheep. You know, all of those resources are out there. Use them to your advantage. And exclusion is pretty common sense, but it takes some work. It takes some initial investment. Um, I put this, if you can exclude the animals from the onset, they will keep moving on. They will move on. When people say, I don't know why this bear keeps coming. There's nothing here for them. Almost always there is something there for them, and, which could be removed by locking it up or excluding them somehow. Exclusion's a big one. This is a great picture because what it's showing is whether this is, this is a big flower garden ornamentals, but they've actually extended this woven wire down. They've dig, dug a trench and they're gonna bury that wire. So when the fox comes and starts trying to dig into there, it's gonna get blocked by that woven wire. Those solutions are all out there. In fact, we're becoming obsolete because you can Google anything you want at this point and find all sorts of cool remedies for a lot of these solutions. So don't overlook Google if you can't get a hold of us right away. Uh, I have to throw in a plug for bear resistant trash containers. Um, it is for two to four hundred bucks you can buy a bear resistant trash container that will literally last you a lifetime. It's a big uh, investment up front but it'll pay off in spades over time. I also want to point out that, um, and I think over time we're probably going to start getting more serious about the enforcement of these laws because we're losing ground with bears, but 336131 actually prohibits knowingly luring bears. So if you're putting food out, and it, whether it's dog food or huge buckets of bird feed or whatever the case is, uh, with the intent of luring a wild bear, you are breaking the law. And that's only because we are concerned about the long-term conservation of these species. We want you guys to be safe, not be inconvenienced, and we want the bears to stay wild. So look into a bear-proof trash can. All right, some of the bigger picture things that Colorado Parks and Wildlife tries to address. Um, again, it's all on statute. We, we talk a lot about what we, we refer to it as game damage. We have a game damage program. Some states don't. Uh, we do, and ours is pretty, pretty broad um, and honestly liberal compared to a lot of other states. 333102 in Colorado Revised Statutes 
The state is liable for damage to livestock or personal property used in the production of raw agricultural products caused by big game. Okay, so that's whether elk are eating hay or bears are killing sheep or whatever. If it's caused by big game, we have some liability for it. We are not liable to livestock deaths caused by coyotes, bobcats, or domestic dogs. Red foxes should probably be in there too. We are not liable for damage to motor vehicles. And you say, what, what does that mean? Well, it could be a deer elk collision on a highway, or it could be a black bear that learns to open your car door and goes in to get the McDonald's uh, residue that your kids are leaving in there. So we're not liable for that, and we're not liable for injury or death to person, any person caused by wildlife. And again, the game damage program is a big deal. It's all, there, there's legal sideboards, there's criteria for eligibility, all of that is spelled out in state statute, but every year we investigate and work through hundreds of game damage claims throughout the state. And it's not just, you know, uh, livestock. We, we look at fence damage, damage to orchards, beehives, you name it, we're in the middle of it if it involves big game. Now with that being said, not to get your hopes up, um, there are instances where damage caused by big game does not fall underneath our damage statutes. And I put this picture up. It's a good example that we deal with a lot every year. These were ornamental tree plantings that a homeowners association did um, north of Gunnison that the elk pounded on last winter. Um, you know, these, these mature pine trees, I forget which species those are, but they were eaten pretty much to the nub. We were not liable for that damage by state statute. So there will be instances where we, we gotta tell you no, and hopefully we can still leave as friends. Um, but we will come up and we will investigate all of these game damage claims to the best of our ability. And um, if they fall within the criterion state statute, we'll work, work through them. The Habitat Partnership Program, I think a lot of you know about it. We, we talk about it, we refer to it as HPP. Um, a portion, I believe it's 5% of every deer and elk license sale for the units around Gunnison, that money goes back into the Habitat Partnership Program operating budget. So again, another program that's derived directly from sportsman's dollars. Um, it's a really good program that's somewhat underutilized here, and there's lots of reasons for that. Its primary aim is to alleviate uh, or try to mitigate for fence and forage conflicts between agriculture and big game. So there's kind of a specific program intent there, but it's definitely an option that we've worked with a lot of you um, on over the years. Don't wanna miss my summary points here. So, in summary, as Colorado's population continues to grow, conflicts are going to grow with them. And education is the first step to avoiding them all together. So please don't ever hesitate to ask us or collaborate with us on a conflict issue. This one's really important. Avoid the trade-off of low investment, temporary fix, such as trap and relocate, versus a higher investment permanent solution like a bear-proof trash can. People want us to move black bears all the time. And we will tell you, we are not going to move that bear because another bear is likely to follow. And until we address issue X, we're not fixing the problem, okay? So avoid that short-term thinking. Urban, urban armoring your home through architectural design, landscape choices, appropriate fencing, bear-proof trash containers can dramatically reduce the potential for conflicts. So reduce your potential right off the bat as soon as you start thinking about your next step in your lives uh, with development or whatever your program, your, your ranching operation, think about that up front to avoid the conflicts. The law allows many remedies for landowners to use in their search for resolution in wildlife conflicts. And we urge you to seek solutions that value both your economic and personal interests as well as wildlife. And if you need more information on a significant scale or even on a small scale, please don't hesitate to contact us. We're easy to find. That was a good one. That was from Lake City. She lived that way for years, I think. Um, please contact us. We're easy to find. We're behind Safeway. Call us anytime. Most everyone in that office has some expertise to try to help you work through some of these issues. And thank you. <laughs>